going to call this meeting to order for the Development Review Board for the City of Montpelier, our meeting for Monday, September 17th, 2018. Uh, my name is Daniel Richardson. I'm the chair of the Development Review Board, and the other members from my right are Rob Goodwin, Meredith Crandall, staff, Kate McCarthy, Ryan Kane. Okay. Uh, first item of business is the approval of the agenda. Do I have I, I, I want to make a, a clarification. It's printed under other business, um, but the last item of business that we'll be taking up today is the informal review of 100 State Street, the new uh, garage proposal that's being proposed, I think, jointly by the city and uh, Bashara. And that's not a actual formal sketch plan. It is an informal review, so it's just under other business as opposed to an actual item of business that we're going to take action on because that's not the intent tonight. But other than that, is there a motion to either approve the agenda or to amend the agenda? Mr. Chair, I move approval of the agenda as printed. Okay. Motion by Kate. Do I have a second? A second. Second by Rob. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. We have an agenda. There are no other comments from the chair tonight. Uh, the approval of the minutes of September 4th will have to be put off to next meeting because we lack a quorum on that. And that brings us to our first application of the evening, 9 Pearl Street. This is the applicant for 9 Pearl Street. Please, sir, if you'll come forward. Bill, could you turn off that air conditioning unit right there, please? Uh, we usually get in trouble with ice. That, one's, that one gets that turned off and on all the time. All right. I'm happy to. There's the power button in the middle. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. For sound. So if you'll state your name for the record, please. Uh, John Boodle. Uh, Mr. Boodle, um, just so you know, uh, normally we are composed of seven members this evening. Due to absences and conflicts, we're down to the bare minimum quorum. So we can proceed with uh, the four members that are before you tonight, um, or it's your right to ask to have this postponed to be heard by the, the full board. So th that's a decision that you, you're you welcome to make. Well, I'd have to ask your advice, because I've never been to these before, so I would need you to advise me whether it's in my interest to come back or whether it's in my interest to stay. You know, I'm, I'm looking for some advice here. Sure. Well, we can't necessarily give that advice, which is the problem. But what I can say is that um, the way in which the board works, and the reason why we offer that, is that out of seven members, if you want your permit approved, four have to vote in the affirmative. Notwithstanding the fact that there's only four of us tonight, um, it means all four of us would have to vote in the affirmative because that number remains the same. Um, and so. Uh, and that so would you're saying for, that if there's seven of you, I get a better chance. Well, it's, it's <laughs> mathematically speaking, um, but it's also in the nature of your approval, which is to say if, if you were going for a permit that had no controversy, was very straightforward, it may not matter whether there were seven of us or four of us. Um, if there is some controversy um, and there is a likely split of the vote, obviously you're playing against the odds in that <laughs> respect. Okay. Bearing that in mind, I will come back because okay. I noticed that Meredith has written a report that I'm looking for your discretion to approve. So I will, if there's more of you, I guess there's more of you to have more discretion. That, that's perfectly acceptable. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll simply table this application until our next regularly scheduled meeting, which would be uh, the first Monday in October. And the calendar is not helping me out. Uh, well, I need October, October 1st. first. I see those on the bottom. Okay. Oh no, sorry. Your your head is literally in front of the calendar, right behind me. It's, it's just, just oh, it's on the agenda. Just, oh, okay. yes. <laughs> All right. I will do that and come back and see you. Then hopefully you have uh, more people. We have to make a. We, we do have to make that motion in the affirmative. So I'll make a move that we continue the application for Nine Pearl Street until. Uh, October 1st, 2018 meeting. Okay, motion by Ryan. Do I have a second? Second that. Okay, second by Rob. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of tabling the application until the October 1st meeting, please raise your right hand. 
All right, Mr. Rudolph. Well, good luck, and uh, I will see we'll see you. if the odds are in your favor next time. I'll see you later. Take oh, care. It's bound to happen. It's a good application. <laughs> <laughs> The next applicant is 156 Elm Street, <clears throat> and that is Joe and Lucy uh, Ferrata. Yep. Is that? If you'll introduce yourself. I'm Joe Ferrata. I'm the owner of 156 Elm Street. Okay, and, and Mr. Ferrata, you heard uh, what I told Mr. Boodle, which is the same that goes for you. You're welcome to go forward tonight sure. uh, with four members, or you're welcome to ask for us to table it. Yeah, I think uh, I think I, I want to move forward. However, uh, it, if it so happens the decision is not in my favor, can I sort of ask for the item to be on the agenda at a subsequent meeting? Yeah, I don't think we've, we we have a, a sort of formal motion to reconsider. But I'll I'll tell you what we can do, which I think may make just as much sense is. If you have a weather report from the board that seems to indicate that there's some difficulty, okay. um, you may wish to say, uh, you know, I'd like to table it. Uh, so anything short of a vote, I think once we cast the vote, we cast the vote. Uh, and All right. there are formal motions to reconsider, although it, they're not necessarily adopted into our, our procedure. Um, but I think it would be the wiser course to simply ask for a weather report at a certain point if, if and I think you'll tell from the, the, the tone of, okay. okay. Sounds good. We can, we can, I know Kate's looking troubled. We can continue the hearing so that he can provide more information if need be at another hearing. Does that right. make more sense to you, Kate? That makes sense for this applicant. Um, I wonder if the other applicant. Um, I, I think that made sense for Mr. Boodle, having okay. written my staff report. Thank you. And, okay. and it was not requested by the previous applicant. It has been now. So right. Thank you. If not asked, not received. Um, so, Mr. Ferrata, I ask you to raise your right hand and I'll put you under oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes. Right. Please let us uh, give us a description of what you're proposing. So basically, um, it, it's a landscaping plan, um, and so what, what we're doing, the matter at issue is a landscaping plan. What we're right. doing is we're converting, um, it's a four-unit building, it's on Elm Street, 156, as I said, and one of the units is currently an office, and we're bringing it back to a residential unit as a permitted use, right? And so it, um, you know, the zoning administrator has reviewed it, and it's sort of a, a minor um, plan request, so forth. Um, and so the issue at hand is around the landscaping, where it, right now there is less landscaping than, than required. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm asking for a waiver. Of, of the landscaping requirements, and to be that's specific, the, I think that's the issue at hand. The, 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 that's at least the issue, a, a controversy. But before we dive into the landscaping, I think it makes sense to just get simply on the record the the nature of the application, the non-controversial aspects, according to staff comment. You're you're proposing this is on the fourth floor, is that? It's actually or so number four unit. I'm sorry. Right, so it's the uh, the unit in the front of the building. There's two units in the front of the building. That's where the access is, and it's second and third floor, basically. And uh, Meredith, as a result of this change, uh, is there a parking increase or decrease? Uh, or neither, no change? Neither really. I mean, it, it, at most, you'd have a decrease in the amount of parking required, you know, that somebody might want. There's really no change needed to the parking plan whatsoever. Um, they, you know, probably don't need as many parking spaces, but they're not going to make any changes to the layout. Right. This is just this is just strictly an internal change. Yeah. Yep. And then um, they've they've made some changes to the landscaping plan at my right. suggestion because that was the only thing that did not 
meet the requirements, really. It was okay. the only reason that this was not just approved administratively. Sure. And, and I'm going through just the general standards that were, you're not changing the lighting, the principal building remains the same. Um, we're within the residential densities. Um, the lot size is, is in accord with the, the district. The street frontage is not changing. The setbacks are not changing. The height of the building's not changing. Um, there's nothing that's implicating erosion, steep slopes, wetlands, riparian areas, stormwater management, access and circulation. Um, and that, that, that was my question really about the parking was to make sure that um, we're not changing the number of parking spaces. So whatever this business had allocated before, it has the same number of parking spaces. And that, that, will, that will be sufficient for the residential use. Um, one note is um, there's no indication about bicycle storage. Um, and where do, more than anything, what we want to understand is just people who are using bicycles that are living at the apartment is there a place for them to be stored, either in the apartment or on the grounds? Um, yes. Okay. And where would that be? So a couple of the units have um, a storage in the back, and it's attached to the, the, the main building. Um, so that, that takes care of them. And then there's a shed that also could be used, uh, utilized as a, as a storage unit. And have you, you've made that available to tenants oh, yeah. for bicycle storage? Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions about any of the other issues before we dive into the world of landscaping? So my understanding from the application is that you currently have, I believe, two hydrangea in the, in the front and three lilac shrubs in the back. And you're proposing, well, what is your proposal? Um, Let's see, so let me go to page eight, I think. And so we're proposing a couple more hydrangeas and um, up to, say, three trees. And so the issue with this particular location is the lack of landscaping and the fact that if there's a little bit of grass that it's, it's whatever you plant there is going to get ruined by the snow plowing in the winter time. So say this either side of the house, there's really no place to plant anything and have it have a chance to survive. Um, and then the issues around the back is kind of like where, you know, you're gonna be pushing snow onto shrubs or trees that you've just planted. So there's limited places for pushing. So if you look at some of the pictures all the way back, so behind the garage, um, there's a green area, and so there's some shrubs there, and so potentially we could plant, um, say, a, up to three trees there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we could plant a couple of shrubs in the front, but it's, just, it's limited in terms of what we can do both sides. Mm -hmm. um, And just so I understand, the uh, on either side of the house, I'm looking at the pictures that you've submitted. Is that is that are those driveways on either side? Yes. Of the house? Yeah. Yeah. So, say if we're if we're looking at the house from the street on the left hand side, it's the driveway that belongs to the property, and that that driveway sometimes gets accessed by the neighbors on the left hand side as well. So there's you know, quite a bit of traffic, but there's it, there's a limited amount of space to plant anything in. Um, on the right-hand side, you know, if you're looking at the house from the street, there's you can see that there's a parking lot there where the cars are parking on a diagonal, and the cars park maybe a couple of feet from the actual porch of the house on the right-hand side. So again, not much space. And, and so between that and the fact that snow is going to get pushed, I don't think anything has a chance of surviving it. The front, um, you know, we could definitely plant a couple more shrubs and we could plant a couple of, you know, um, 
crab apple trees in the front as well, um, that would work. And that, that's probably a place where it would have the most impact. Um, and sort of in, in the area that I, I mentioned before, which is uh, behind the garage, that sort of green area where there's a green, there's grass there, obviously, and then there's shrubs and a couple of trees alongside the buildings. Um, so it's, it's kind of limited that way. So at least in the front, in the front yard, you know, if there were additional trees, how much space, well, let me strike that. Let me step back. How, how much space between the front, your front porch and the sidewalk is there? Uh, the most 10 feet, maybe, yeah, the most. So there's a walkway in the middle, yeah. Is this the, the number we would be looking at on the uh, proposed, the diagram with the proposed? Yeah, uh, roughly, this this is kind of an old diagram, but just, yeah, it's, it's 14 and a half, a ballpark. It, okay. Yeah, it doesn't seem that way. And we, you know, we were looking at it to put a tree in each one of the sections. So the sort of the grass se section in the front of the house is divided by the walkway to the, to the house, to the steps. And so if you plant a tree right in the middle there, it might work. That's how limited it is. But it wouldn't, you can really put two trees that then turn into say 15 feet, you know, high and maybe 10 feet across. It, there's just not that much. Okay. We're, um, you know, one of the purposes of this section Putting aside the numbers, one of the purposes of this section is to create visual interest. Absolutely. To, you know, to kind of, yeah. for the benefit of all assembled, um, to sort of screen buildings, even if they're nice looking buildings and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so, with that in mind, um, did you at all contemplate something up toward the sidewalk um, on either side of the walkway, perpendicular to the walkway? Um, I know um, other properties have little. A lily right near you have little lilies right near their walkways or just some visual something or other to I'm oh, sorry over here to um to break up yeah I, that slope my concern with that I mean if you look at the properties next to it both to the right and the left there's really nothing there and my concern is with the you know the the, the plowing the, the walkway plow that comes around that if you put it too close to that um, that I, I don't, the chances of survival, again, are, my guess they're going to be minimal. And there's some setbacks as well um, that we have to adhere to, right? Which the, the, the plants can go up to the setback. Up to the setback. So Interesting. I mean, especially if you're not talking to, you know, a tree. I mean, that's <coughs> one of the, my questions for you, Kate, is in, you know, a lot of the landscaping is about trees and shrubs, not necessarily annuals or perennials. Yeah, good point. And, and I, as soon as I started asking about that, I, I actually corrected myself. But lilies won't do the trick, <laughs> even though there, in fact, there are, in fact, some next door. Um, yeah. I mean, I lilies would survive the plow, but we're talking trees well, and shrubs. And those, different, so. yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's worthwhile just to, like, run through what the, the actual um, stated purpose for this requirement are. It says provide direction to and enhance building entrances, enhance and shade walkways, provide visual breaks along blank building facades, intercept and filter stormwater runoff, and it says plant materials should be planted in groupings and distributed around the areas of site visible from public vantage points. And I guess I'd just like to hear a little bit about how you think the proposal that you've put forward does accomplishes those goals or doesn't accomplish those goals? Yeah, my sense is, you know, where the shrubs are planted right now, there's a couple right next to the porch that if we planted some more there, they would have sort of a visual impact. And so that would be a benefit. Uh, if perhaps we planted a tree in each one of the uh, grass sections, both to the left and right, uh, that would eventually sort of uh, grow to, to, to have an impact. Um, so and we're not talking about, so con conceivably we could plant something that won't take that long um, because it's not a tiny tree, so to speak. So um, 
so those are those are the things that we're thinking about. Maybe a couple of trees and, and additional shrubs that that had stand a chance to survive. Um, the, in the floor, we see an apple tree next to the right driveway. Is that still there? Yes. Yeah. Is that, and is that on your property, or is that? No, that's on the property next door. Because okay. of, yeah. It's it's quite an old tree as well. Okay. I'm just pulling up my phone so that I can see what you're seeing. It looked like it's in uh, photograph. I think it was the number one that one. was numbered one. And actually, the street, the Google Street View, shows it. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. So, are you are you now proposing in addition to a, an additional hydrangea on either side of the existing hydrangea, so yes. putting one tree in each side of the front? Yeah, I, th I think we could do that. And that would work well. And and so eventually, it might look like that um, that tree that you have, you know, the next the next door. I guess just to take some testimony on it, uh, how, do you think planting 40 shrubs, 40 additional shrubs, and six additional trees would serve the purposes that I described earlier as far as the landscaping requirements? In, th in theory, if you had the right conditions, yes. That makes I mean, on your property? No. Okay. No, it doesn't. It's just you look at it and you go, well, this doesn't make sense here. It, it won't have the visual impact that you you're wanting for it to have, and there's just no room on either side of the house, and that's where the length is, right? So, most impact I think would be in the front of the house. And do you feel that adding two hydrangeas and the trees, as you described, would meet the goals that Ryan read? Yeah, I would think so. That would be definitely a, a visual improvement. Right. Well, and I would envision that at least the f trees in the front yard, you'd want them as ornamental rather than, say, like a large deciduous tree that's going to fall into your house with right. the canopy or grow into your house with the canopy. Right. Um, just because of the limited space that you have between the front yard, where, wherever you have to plant them and, and your house. Right, right. Any further uh, questions? I guess just to confirm, you are proposing, as here, a crab apple or cherry tree tree in the front yard. Two of them, Two one, of them. one yes. in each sort of grass area to the left and right of the uh, walkway. Yeah. Okay. In addition to the three that you're still proposing, adding in the back, is that? We could. I don't think they have as much impact, but they certainly add to the greenery. We could do that. What's the pleasure of the board? Any further questions? Um, yeah, I don't. I think we. we <laughs> I think we have uh, examined this to the highest degree. Um, what's the pleasure of the board? Do you wish to take this under deliberation, or did, Ryan? I'm seeing a no. Ready to make a motion? Sure. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we um, approve the minor site plan application at. Give me a draft. Like a, hold on. Let me just give me half a second. Oh yeah, there we go. Great. I'll make a motion to approve the application for minor site plan approval, and to grant an exception to the section 3203 landscaping minimum requirements, uh, as presented in the application, uh, with the addition of two additional uh, crab apple or cherry trees in the front of the house as described by the applicant um, and with the additional condition that the landscape may be maintained in a healthy condition and that dead or dying plants be replaced within one growing season with a comparable plant. Okay, motion by Ryan. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Kate. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. All right, your permit is granted. Uh, there will be a written decision issued shortly um, through the zoning office. And uh, But have a good evening. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. You too.
Okay, the next item of business falls under other business, as I said at the beginning. Uh, we are going to hear from the city. I'm not going to put anyone under oath, and just as a guideline to what's going to be discussed and what's going to be reviewed, my understanding is that this is an informal review. Nothing that's being discussed counts as either testimony towards the application. It's just an opportunity for us to review the project, hear um, some details, ask questions, hear comments from the public, um, which will be given an opportunity. If you are a member of the public and do wish to make a comment, I will ask that you go to the microphone that's right there and please state your name uh, just so we have a record of that. Um, and also state your address. Um, if you're not a resident of Montpelier, then you don't have to state your address. Just simply say you're not a resident but wish to speak. We won't stop anyone from out of town speaking. And if possible, if you do speak, also sign in on the sign-in sheet, please. Okay. Uh, I yeah. was going to actually give a sort of a procedural overview that's in some ways more for the board members, but also for members of the public before gives, Greg gives his presentation, if that's okay. Great. Okay. Um, it is getting recorded, too. Okay. Um, so, in this instance, as most, if not all of you are aware, um, the city has taken over the parking garage project that had been approved previously for the Hilton and Capitol Plaza project under permit number Z-2017-145. Um, the garage proposal now has a larger footprint with 128 more parking spaces, um, and one section of that approximately in, in between 50 and 40 feet, depending on how, where you measure, of the building um, is now going to be on the city leased Heaney lot. So just logistically speaking, there are three big steps that are going to be happening that are going to be going through the Development Review Board. Um, we're going to need to amend the prior hotel site plan approval to change it to off-site parking, at least a portion of the parking. That application and approval is going to be under the old 2006 um, as amended through 2011 regulations. Then um, the hotel has also applied for a subdivision of its lot so that a portion of the lot will then be granted to the city. Um, and that will be a subdivision under the new regulations. And then the city has to apply for site plan approval of the modified garage plan. Be even though it's a modified plan, the entire plan needs to go through the full site plan review process. Um, that also includes design review. Is that because it's under new ownership? It's because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new applicant, Canadian. new ownership, new design, everything gets triggered. Um, just so you know, as with the old garage, this is in the river hazard area, but you won't really need to worry about that. Um, there will be notations on some of the plans that have to do with, with river hazard so that we're, because that's going to be reviewed independently but concurrently by the floodplain manager. Um, so just another warning, amidst all these applications, I will be appending in legal opinions that we should we're anticipating getting because there's going to need to be a parking agreement between the city and the hotel for that off-site parking. Um, we're going to need an opinion regarding the construction of a city-owned building that crosses onto leased versus owned land and how we deal with that. Um, and then there will need to be a right-of-way or easement agreement dealing with frontage or creation of a city-owned road. So those are three big things that are going to come in that weren't necessarily dealt with under the prior garage. Excuse me. Could you repeat what the first legal opinion will be regarding? Uh, well, it's not necessarily a legal opinion, but a parking agreement. There needs to be an off-site parking agreement, and that's part of the hotel amended site plan approval. Thank you. Yep. Um, so after tonight, the next big hearing um, will hopefully be the October 1st sketch plan review for the subdivision for the hotel. That application is in. 
so that looks to be set to go. That's the next hearing here. Um, and then assuming that everything gets in on time for the October 15th Development Review Board meeting, you will see all together the site plan amendment. Because that really has to happen first. We have to have approval for that off-site parking for the hotel for any of this to happen. Then the final subdivision review and then site plan for the new city garage. And one reason we're trying to put it all together is because otherwise there's going to be a lot of explaining if there are members who are there for, say, the site plan amendment or subdivision but aren't there for the final site plan. It's all interrelated. Now, will design review take place simultaneously with this? Design review is going to be happening um, as long as application deadlines are met on October 1st. Okay. That's the, this is the tentative proposed schedule, assuming all goes as planned. Right. Um, do you have any questions for me? Um, yes. Um, I understand there's a concurrent public outreach and feedback process being undertaken by City Council and it's it, could you tell how that process fits in and whether it will constitute testimony before us or if it's just a, a um, separate conversation um, that, that helps create the application we'll see yeah I that's not going to be testimony before the development review board it's you know the that's potentially testimony before the city council. Um, you know, there's, there is a hearing on Wednesday, a special city council hearing um, at 6.30 on Wednesday, and it, it's, just, it's a separate layer of the decision-making process. So that's more about the town working on its proposal <coughs> with public input. That's what that's it sounds like. That's my understanding, and I'm sure manager. Sue or, or Bill could talk yeah, more to that city. later. Okay. All right, just uh, in case folks were sort of curious how all the moving parts fit together, yeah. I wanted to clarify but, that. Yeah, that's the city making making its own decisions about design, and then that design still has to be approved through zoning and the Development Review Board. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So, Greg, please introduce yourself and uh, let us hear your proposal. Thank you for your time this evening. Uh, my name's... Greg Rabideau from so Rabideau Architects. Be careful about the uh, microphone. Yeah, I, I see it now. Uh, I'm Greg Rabideau from Rabideau Architects, and um, we're pleased to be here presenting the latest version of this project. We've uh, we started this process uh, back in the fall of 2017 and and uh, or 16 and went through. No, it was, yeah, it was 16, and um, the end result was a. Uh, the existing capital plaza would remain. There would be a new 84-unit Hampton Inn and Suites and a 220-space parking garage. Um, as time went on, the city uh, and the applicant had lots of conversations about how there's a greater need for parking than just what this project requires. And so now I'm before you to present a new, uh, new thinking on this, which is to take what we've done and build on that to uh, increase the par total parking to 348 spaces, and to uh, um, there'll be some other things as we talk. Uh, when I first got up, I handed you this, and if anybody in the audience would like a copy, I have extra copies here. But um, this is this was just graphically cleaned up to make the plan a little easier to read. And, and just to be clear, we're talking about. Um, sheet number it's marked SP-1 yes it's a sketch subdivision plan with a revision date of, uh, tit of uh, actually I put the 20th on there just because uh, I needed a separate date from the earlier versions um, the purpose of this document is to just try to help you understand the configuration of the lots the big blocks that we're working with here so as I look at the plan you see up in here the capital plaza portion of this um, currently extends back behind Christ Church all the way to the Haney lot. Um, you'll see right down there in the corner where the next to the, the new hotel is a, is a proposed lot number two. This is the uh, parcel of land that will be calved off the original Capitol Plaza lot and gifted to the city as a part of this exchange of values for uh, to underwrite the uh, construction of the garage. Um, so 
the original one lot will become two lots and uh, of roughly uh, 2.19 and uh, about a half an acre, 0.54 acres. Um, then the third piece that I need to direct your attention to is a sort of shaded area that runs through lot number one and it's listed as a proposed right of way or easement. Um, we're waiting for guidance from the city on what precise form that's meant to take, but the idea is that this is the deeded access to the garage, uh, which otherwise would not have direct frontage on State Street. So the purpose of this was just to illustrate those three components. As it happens, I was uh, fortunate enough to get uh, an actual survey from Civil Engineering Associates earlier today, and so I have also incorporated actual surveyed values for the uh, for the shape of the Haney lot and the buildings around it to help facilitate discussion with the board and with the public as far as how this thing fits into the fabric of downtown. Um, the, uh, the, the city managers have been um, undertaking public outreach to, to hear some concerns. One of the concerns that was raised by a citizen was that there was this thought that we should look at the possibility of future reuse of this as something other than a garage at some point. Um, so the second small package I handed you tonight is an alternative version of the plan um, that I'd like to talk to you about. So we're going to be talking about the garage itself and the fact that it can be configured in more than one way to do the job. I think the concern raised by the citizen was that, you know, maybe people won't be driving cars at some point. If the city owns this building, what are they going to do with it? So we undertook a, an investigation of whether or not flat floor plates with, with steeper ramps could be employed in this location. And the uh, small package I gave you is, is, uh, is the result of that exploration. Um, we're going to present both options and keep both options alive until the city council de declares a clear preference. Um, and so, uh, so, Mr. Whitaker, if, if if there's a document that you Who's referring to, that's right. Uh, I'll seek for clarification. It, it doesn't necessarily. It's sort of intimidating to lean over someone's shoulder. I, just so we understand what packet you're talking about, is it the A102? It's a series uh, of maps on the title block of Simons Engineering. who is our parking lot consultant, and uh, it's uh, yeah. It starts with A101 and goes through. Um, Essentially, we. Um, I, I only have I have a 102, a 103, 104, a 105, and 203. Is that that's it? Okay, that's the whole of it. Um, so uh, the uh, the two options are the original concept, which would be a helical design or or, or sort of internal ramping. That's been part of this design since the approval. So that way you would drive in on level landings and the parking bays themselves would ramp up. There'd be level landings that are at each end of the building to turn and go again. Um, the, uh, the design will, uh, being contemplated under the new, the new regulations allows for a different configuration of parking, uh, parking bays. So one significant difference in the original concept or the approved concept over what we're proposing now is that we've eliminated angled parking. And this is, this is good because given the volume of parking we have without the angled parking, was, it, was, it was solving a problem that the regulations have now solved for us. And we can eliminate that angled parking. So these would be 90 degree parking stalls, 18 foot uh, parking stalls, 20 foot drive lanes, and 18, uh, you know, so on and on. Um, uh, this advantages of this particular approach, it's, it's probably the most efficient of garage designs. Um, the slopes that it would take to get from one landing to the other are three and a half percent, so they're, they're less than the ramping you would normally need for accessibility, which means, in general, it's a, a, um, uh, a more universally friendly design because you can park at various places and still it's still accessible to get to the elevators. Um, and uh, this, this is a design that, uh, that lends itself to the use of precast concrete construction, which is a... a Desirable in the case in this case because it's uh, more durable in the city. Um, the, you know the city cares about durability, obviously. Um, in the alternative scheme, the parking levels are flat, and at each end there's something called a speed ramp which goes up a half level or five feet. Um, 
one obvious benefit of this is that then you have flat floor plates, which could have some adaptive reuse in the future. Um, but I'll have to talk to you about why that may be limited. Um, one thing about that is those ramps are, are pretty steep. They're like 15%, and that's fine for parking garages. You've probably all used parking garages that are like that at some point or another. Um, I know the, the, the one that springs to mind is the one at the airport up in uh, Montreal, but there are other ones closer by. Um, this is, a, this is a, uh, also a good scheme. Uh, it, the levels would be split lengthwise so that the, uh, um, if, if everybody has that last page, that A203, um, it shows in section form what, how that looks. So you have, you have the flat floor. Yeah, be careful. Sorry. Or there's two of them, sorry. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, though, when, when I posited this challenge to our, our consultants, uh, you know, they said, well, we can make the geometry work, but in order to be able to convert this to some other use in the future, we would have to increase the structural strength of the building because cars don't weigh as much as office space, believe it or not. I, it, it really sh it shocked me, too, with the live loading is like 25 pounds versus uh, 40 to 50 for office space or, you know, and on up. So the city has a decision to make. We can make either one work. Uh, we, we took this request seriously. Um, but uh, this, would, um, this would end up, if you, were to, if you were going to design it such that it could be converted to office space in the future, it's our, it's our professional opinion that the, uh, you would increase the cost of the structure possibly by as much as about 30%. So uh, that's going to translate into a, a serious budget problem. I think, I think the consensus among us with, uh, with the city manager's office and city staff is that the, the, that the budget is not so fat that we could absorb that. But I want the public to understand that we, we have looked at this issue seriously, and this, is an, this can remain a live issue, but the, the problem will not be one of geometry. It will be one of dollars and cents, if that makes sense. Um, Just to be clear, Greg, this this is more informational. I I presume you, you, this isn't necessarily one of our zoning bylaws that's going to be triggered by one or the other design. No, this is us listening to the public, and I'm sharing it with you because we're going to until until there's a final determination made uh, by the city itself, and and we're here to support you in this effort. Um, you know, we'll keep both. We'll keep. We'll keep the options alive. Keep the discussion going because. Um, I, I I just want to be careful because you know when you describe something like that, I may have personal opinions about it, but I, that this isn't really necessarily going to be the ultimate forum to decide that. That sounds like something. No, it's that, not. And that no. sounds like something that the city has to um, consider probably through their public process with the city council. Exactly so. Um, yeah, okay. and I just want to. Now there's there's city as regulator. And we're here to do that tonight, but right. there's also city as owner and 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 representatives of the general population. So I feel it's, I felt it was important to sort of give you a little of that history because at, at some point we're going to come back here in October with more complete designs, and you could see either one of these. Our strong recommendation is to stick with the original design because it's it's efficiency and and it's. Uh, um, you know, it, it's a more f uh, user-friendly kind of configuration. Um, but we will support the, the city in either direction, and both of them work. Um, I have a question about the cost piece and building on what Dan just said, that, that yeah. not, uh, it's not one of our criteria for right. the ultimate approval. It's this is curiosity. Um, when you're talking about cost, are you talking about straight-up construction cost, or is there any sort of a life cycle, life cycle analysis that has been done taking into account possible future reuse and tax revenue? things like that no uh, this is this is strictly a, a bricks and mortar kind of uh, proposition um, because uh, you know to you know to go from 25 pounds of live load to 40 pounds of live load a square foot is it's a it's an increment but it's a significant increment and uh, so the columns and and uh, beams and everything would have to be just a little bit more beefy to handle that problem residential and office are the same as far as the load required yeah, you know, I mean, the residential is typically 40 in the units and 80 in the corridors. 
you know, we'd have to somehow figure that out. But uh, um, uh, uh, it's funny. I mean, you take a 2,000-pound car and you put it in a 200-square-foot parking lot, and you, you, you know, it's, it's not that much weight, even though it all rests on the tires. I was very surprised. Um, so so that there's the issue of the functional relationships of the inside of the garage, which is something that we're going to come back and say this is how we're going. And then there's also the issue of the exterior appearance of the building has been raised a number of times. Our approach was hammered out over many, many meetings with the design, the design advisory committee and the, the previous membership of the development review board. Some overlap, I understand. but. Um, and it included a combination of masonry, stone, and a, uh, and a fairly significant amount of something called a green wall or a living wall, which um, the renderings show best. I think there is a, uh, hopefully there's a rendering in your packages. There was. I have a black and white version of it here. But it, I, don't, I don't think we have yeah, that. I, I don't have that. I don't have that. I don't have that in the particular package. OK. Um, well, uh, you know, I can bring this up and just kind of let you get a look at it. But this was what was, this is the extended version. Okay, so we have the high area, this is just the same. So the one that you have. Okay. So it's, it's a, and it is, again, this is the same color, so you just don't So yeah, I, I I think the um, I think the board appear to have enough to sort of understand our proposal. This this was our proposal. Uh, it evolved to be this way for several reasons. Um, first of all, in order to avoid mechanical ventilation of the garage, we do have to have 50% of that facade open to the air somehow. Um, and this is a, uh, a kind of clever way to allow that to happen while still giving some sense of enclosure. Uh, it also came about after several lengthy discussions with the members of Christ Church Episcopal who have plans to develop the rear portion of their lot at some point in the near future. And uh, they didn't want to be looking out at a, at a blank wall or a, you know, a hardscape. Um, so the proposed solution that we offered at the time was to, was to explore using this living wall material as a, as a way to, so when, if they put a housing project on their project, on their property, they'd be looking out at green, growy stuff and not necessarily. And also we felt that uh, um, given the footprint of the building and everything, it would be desirable to break the facade up with more than one treatment. So it, it's doing several things. Um, and perhaps since not everybody was on the board when, when this came through, uh, our landscape architects, uh, Wagner Hodgson, uh, have done this in numerous locations. Uh, they're proposing a, a wide variety of plant materials, uh, Boston ivy, Virginia creeper, trumpet vines. Trumpet vines, in, you know, in particular, you know, they, they, they grow everywhere in Vermont, very hardy. Um, if you have a wood lot, you know, I live out in the woods, uh, you know, you, you're familiar with trumpet vines. Um, and then, you know, we picked, uh, picked things for um, initial fast growth, but also long-term durability. These are all urban kind of friendly plants. And uh, it, the estimated initial grow-in is pretty quick. It was uh, estimated uh, during the previous permit rounds that uh, within three years, you would have substantial vegetation on, that, on this matrix. Um, we still are advocating this solution. Um, and yet we, we are taking public input on, on the exterior design as well, which is separate from most of the permitting issues. I expect when we come back to see in October, we'll have a definitive answer on this, but we're advocating for this right now and then uh, um, uh, hope to, uh, you know, hope to try to incorporate uh, questions and interests coming from the public to try to enhance this design. It's happened pretty quickly. I know just taking the thing and stretching it out may not necessarily in the end be the best result. So we're going we're gonna to take the idea of stretching it out and try to refine it so that it's, uh, it's better composed, more proportion, proportional, all those good things. Um, in, this, in both of these schemes, it's hard to sort of define floor level. Um, but essentially, uh, the flat 
scheme would have it's because it's a split level one level would stick up about five stories um, in this ramp scheme the original scheme we kind of come up to uh, uh, sort of four and a half levels um, total height on the scheme as proposed uh, is like 45 feet to the parapet with a section where the elevator and the stairs are that sticks up a little bit more than that um, and that is uh, in a district that allows six-story construction at 45 feet, it would still be substantially shorter than the recently approved Hampton Inn. And uh, some technical things will be going into this application. Uh, dealing with floodplain, the, the garage will, uh, in fact, have some flood storage capacity in its footprint. Um, it, it's, it's designed to sort of minimize the importation of fill into the area by sort of leaving it hollow inside. And if uh, I'll have to explain this in more detail after you've had a chance to look at it, but um, stormwater in a flood event could flow in into the lowest level and through the lowest level and back out without impacting the structure negatively. And that's, that's kind of a wet uh, flood proofing, I guess, is what they call it. But we've been working very closely with Audra and, and uh, also with the state to, uh, to define the best practices for doing this. But, and for now, I think it suffices to say that it's it's very much a part of what we're doing, and we're uh, we are we are taking that you know we're, we're working that issue hard. Um, if you look at my plan SP1 again, you'll see at the at the easterly end of the park, parking garage, there's a sort of shaded area, and that is there simply to indicate how much longer this garage is versus the one that was previously approved. Um, that's something I want you to sort of understand. You know, when we say, well, how far over the line does it go? Obviously, now you can see with all this sort of triangular geometry that there's no one number for that. Um, but I did, to the extent that I, I had that information, I labeled it on the plan. Unfortunately, at 11 by 17, it's probably a little hard to read, but um, uh, it is, uh, I think it's like 40 feet on average more. Um, One other feature that I think I would point out to you just because it's uh, important to know is that there is, we are still maintaining a green buffer on the northerly side of the garage, uh, basically at the southerly portion of what will be the city's lot uh, as an accommodation to the uh, folks at Christ Church and their future project. Um, given the changes in the numbers and geometry, you know, because of the new regs, that, that is shown right now at just a little under eight feet. It's at seven feet nine, but we are preserving that feature, um, uh, even though it's a little bit smaller. I think uh, the essential function of that is, is um, I think, in keeping with our commitment to Christ Church, and I'm bringing that up for their benefit more than yours, but um, just to let you know that. We are also going to, when we come in to amend the Hampton Insight Plan, we'll probably have some vertical control changes. The, the basic layout will remain as it has been, but you may see some changes in the grading plan uh, as we finalize our understanding of the stormwater regs. Um, but the essential plan as presented is, is what we want to go with. Uh, no proposed changes to the hotel structure itself in terms of the number of rooms or the height or any of that. Uh, the changes would really be the imposition of the easements, the calving off of the lot, and whatever technical changes we have to make to make the utilities work in this kind of new configuration. So that's, I think that's everything. I, 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 I'm sure you have questions, so. <laughs> we do. Um, I'll lead off just a couple of questions. Um, you have the width of the proposed right-of-ways that are uh, going behind the Capitol Plaza in front of the Hampton Inn that are going to be granted to the city for access? It's, it's currently shown at 22 feet. Uh, we've had an ongoing dialogue with Public Works. Uh, the most important thing to them is, is, is not sort of, a, sort of the horizontal geometry, but the cross-section of that road. But they want to make sure that it, it's uh, the uh, underlayment, the, uh, the pavement, the, and the stone sub-base are, are built to city street standards to support 
heavier traffic, which we anticipated anyhow because we expect there's still a lot of truck deliveries that come through here. There's buses that'll come through there. So that's something we have agreed to. But right now it's shown at 22 feet. Um, and if, you know, once we have guidance from the city as to what form this needs to take, if it needs to be 24 or something other, it could be. Uh, and just in comparison, say like Taylor Street, how the paved, the traveled area on Taylor Street is going to be? I've never measured that personally, but I think it's going to be very similar. I mean, I, I've driven across that bridge a million times, and I, I know that's not 20 feet wide, but uh, I don't think the pavement's really that much wider. Um, you know, a car is six foot six wide. You know, a, a typical travel lane is really 18 feet, or is that really eight feet. Um, uh, but uh, two 10-foot travel lanes with no parking on either side, or if there was parking, it would be outside the right-of-way, um, is, is more than adequate. And are you anticipating submitting a traffic study? For we are. A traffic study was undertaken under the original design, which swept up the existing uses, the new hotel, and, and a 220-car parking garage, distributing uh, trips to both Taylor Street and to, and to uh, State Street. Resource System Group is currently feverishly working to update that report to reflect the increased volumes. We're, on our side of the table, are not entirely clear yet from the city as regulator uh, whether or not they would like to see a more expanded traffic study. Um, you know, it's a tough call because we're, everyone is well aware that at the wrong time of day, State Street can get pretty bottled up. Um, and that the intersection at, uh, at State Street and 14 Main Street uh, can, can be problematic at certain times of the day. Um, but, um, you know, one of the, the initial approved plan that we went through, in the end, we found that traffic was acceptable. So what we have to evaluate is the, does that additional 128 spaces a, is it, is it significantly generating traffic, or is it capturing traffic that's already here, which is, I think, the hope of the Downtown Business Association. Um, but uh, we'll have to evaluate whether or not that additional 128 spaces generates significantly more traffic that would impact that in some way. Um, sure. I mean, obviously, you're, you're free to make the argument that it does or doesn't. Um, but I think it will be helpful, um, you know, in part, at least my concern, I'm just one member, is that, um, you know, before we were talking about a parking garage, I think in a limited scope, which is that it was always meant to serve the private property. So it was intended for the Hampton Inn and its guests and possibly the Capitol Plaza and possibly an arrangement with one of the, some of the tenants. Um, now we're talking about an expanded garage that's going to be uh, likely serving a, a more general public. Uh, and I don't know how the city is allocating those additional spaces, whether they're going to be rented out to people or to the general public. Um, but it would be good to understand those traffic impacts. And if the argument at the end of the day is those additional 128 cars don't amount to a hill of beans in an already busy State Street you know, that will let the, I think, I would be curious to see that data in right. support of that. Right, well, uh, next time I see you, we'll have something from Resource System Group on that level. Um, you know, I think, I think what we're still discussing and, and we need to get to a bottom of pretty quickly is, you know, how far away from the project entrances do we go to look at the impacts of, of this traffic as it's distributed out into the, into the city, um, you know. Uh, I can't say much more about traffic. <laughs> okay, I don't. It's not my expertise, but sure. we do have a pro, we do have one in process, and it will come in in October when we come to see you. I just think that that's likely to be an issue, and so it, yeah. feedback to your team and and to Understood. RSG, um, they will want to have something. At least I'll I'll be looking for something. There's a there's a strong desire on the part of the design team and our city clients to. Um, to try to make as much of this par parking available to as many people as possible. We're looking at various kind of parking management equipment that would allow us to advertise available spaces. Um, the one, the one long-term 
agreement for parking that I, I can definitely speak about is the one that, that will be given to the uh, Capitol Plaza. Um, that is in exchange for them giving the land and doing all that, but that they'll be participants in the garage still. In the earlier approval processes, we had, I think, identified 174 spaces required by your regulations to serve that completed project. Um, you know, we still have something like 51 surface spaces that will primarily serve the existing Capitol Plaza and their commercial tenants on the ground floor. Um, but, you know, I, I think Christchurch will probably participate in this garage if their housing project goes through. Uh, and I know that we want to have some of this available for downtown businesses. It's very important. So, um, Jim, I can speak to a little bit of this discussion. Yep. So, um, first thing to note is that um, under the zoning regulations, even though maybe the board could ask for more traffic study information, there's nothing in the regulations with this particular project that is triggering a more in-depth traffic study. Um, the Department of Public Works at this point is driving to what degree the traffic study is, is adding information at this point. Um, and then some information I have um, for the breakdown of, of traffic, of, of parking spots right now, is my understanding and you know, people who are here from is that we're talking about 200 passes for the hotels, um, 30 passes eventually that would go to the Christchurch housing project if that were to, assuming that that happens. In the meantime, those would potentially be just part of the hourly parking. Um, another 38, so a total of 68 that would be hourly parking. And then they're looking to try and find other people to um, rent up to 80 monthly parking passes. So it would bring us to two, 348 spots with 104 flex spaces. So that's the current breakdown that, that the city's playing with. Um, forgive me, I'm going to ask a question about the traffic study. You may, you may have just told us that you were, you had told us everything you know, but I'll give it a try anyway. Okay. Um, as we think about the scenarios to test in the traffic study, it would be interesting to test a scenario that assumes those 80 spaces for rent um, are contracted to the state, for example, for a replacement of the car lot parking. Because I think that 80 spaces that are coming and going at state office um, opening and closing times would be a different impact on the area than if those 40 spaces were for that, or if 80 spaces were for downtown businesses. And so I think that would be useful to know um, okay. if possible. I'll, I'll talk to our traffic consultants. They may already be doing it. Um, okay. They may just be doing PPM or whatever. Um, well, some uses are some uses are going to are going to be less problematic in terms of the worst hour of the day, which I think yeah. is right around 4.30, 5 o'clock, right? Um, yeah. at both ends of State Street, and, and maybe a, to a lesser degree sometime between a 7 and 9 in the morning. But I think the PM peak hour is definitely the design hour here. Hotels, you know, check in is at it, is it 3, check outs at 11, they tend to be off peak. And so, you know, other uses like that. I think if, if, the, if the church had a housing project there, they'd be sort of off peak or at least counter flow. They'd be more likely leaving town than coming to town during the work hours, right? Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the mix. Okay. Um, so, next question, I, at least I had, um, beyond the traffic. I'm, I'm looking at the SP1 design, and it looks like the, the new parking garage juts out into the uh, Mary Heaney trust lot it does and that's the portion that that the project's going to be leasing from the Heaney trust is that correct no the city leases the Heaney lot now they have right. a they have a long-term lease long -term. on that lot I think the the legal question is you know they're gonna be building on that that lot that's not for me to settle <laughs> right no and I, you know and to a certain extent we don't we don't have to evaluate the the legal 
documents, we just simply have to understand that such are in place. Yes, um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm trying to understand. So the way this building is situated, or at least the way it looks, the, he, the building um, fills up the back of the lot. And it looks like there's about, print's a little small, but it, at the front it looks like something like 24 feet from the edge of the building to the oh, yeah. boundary right. line, and then it narrows in the back to about 10 feet. Is that, what are the, what are the, is there any plans for either that area or access to the area behind it? Is that presumed to be for a different use? One concern, obviously, that we have is when we create these, these type of, or give permit approval to creation of these type of lots, are we cutting off other uses in that? Um, and is that, I mean, it looks like it's, it, significant portion of the back lot? Um, a couple of things. Uh, common to the railroad tracks, the, the city of Montpelier already has an easement through this property for their bike path, their expanded bike path program. Um, so on the south side of the garage, uh, there's going to be the bike path, and there's also going to be some site development and previously approved sort of park-like environment with bike tools and, and there are different little granite blocks emerging out of the ground at different ele elevations for seating and a lot of landscaping. Um, that we, we've always envisioned that sort of south side of the garage sort of facing Memorial Drive as being, as, as, as having quite a bit of plant material growing on the building, but also, you know, next to the building, right? So that, um, you know, to sort of, sort of rebuild the river's edge, which normally has trees and stuff growing along it, but, and also to shade the bike path and to screen the building a little bit. Um, Access to that would be there's an accessible route that goes from State Street down past the, the facade of the Capitol Plaza and the Northfield Savings Bank between the hotel and the garage, and then there's there's a direct sidewalk connection to the bike path there. So the public access is meant to go down through there. On the east end of the garage, where you're talking about, there is a, a adjacent, adjacent property owner. I'm thinking it's Overlook Park. LLC and that small little uh, barn-like building. I'm sure the old garage. The old garage, and uh, so down through there, I've I've maintained a, a driveway access to. Uh, they have a small parking lot behind that garage, so there's a there there is a surface. There would still be a driving surface going around to get to that rear parking lot. Okay, and but then beyond that, where you know it, it significantly narrows. Yes. I mean, would that, uh, would that be maintained as a, a, a pavement or drivable area uh, um, and then behind and then to the south of the garage but to the north of the bike proposed bike path? Is that? I think if we can successfully preserve the, the rights of the folks at Overlook, Overlook Park, um, anything beyond that driveway connection, in my mind, ought to be planted. I mean, there's no practical way to get parking back there, and uh, you know it, it seems there's there's an opportunity there. The north branch of the Winooski River is right there. There's a new bike path bridge that parallels the uh, the Bowstring Trust Bridge that goes over the, the river now. Um, so there's a lot of stuff already going on in there, um, but um, you know, I, I, I just think I mean I understand it's not strictly within the sort of four corners of the specific permit of the garage uh, but it's it seems to me it's also logically implicated by this and so I, I don't I don't intend to push you to design on the fly if there's there haven't been thoughts and obviously no, I, 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 there have been I, I you know uh, Wagner Hodgson is preparing an updated landscape plan for the green wall system to work you know we have to have a certain amount of sort of at least two or three feet of soil at the bottom of the wall for those plants to take root in. They don't need much, believe it or not, but they do need something. And, and uh, so, you know, at least immediately adjacent to the building, we're going to have landscaping. But it, in my mind, anything south of that south wall of the garage really ought to be parkland. Okay. Um, we, we may, in fact, have some depressions or things we may do some earth farming to as part of our flood management scheme but it would all be greened up 
I, I look forward to seeing what you come up with. But I, I, I think it's going to have to, you know, we're going to have to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. um, any questions from any other board members? Yeah, just a question. Right. Regarding that Overlook Park LLC section there, did the CEA survey cover the entire um, lease lot, shall we say, or was it just the exterior of the lot that's being subdivided? Um, so was the line between the lease lot and Overlook Park survey, is that shown um, per the CEA survey, or is that? Yeah, everything east of our original property boundary and the easterly property boundary of Christ Church is that everything from from here over is surveyed is 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 from CEA based on a lot of intense deed research. So um, no, I, th I think that's what that's what we're excited to present this new plan to you tonight because it fills in a lot of gray areas to, to have that there. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. Uh, it, it is accurate. <laughs> Okay. Um, any other questions? So I don't know if members of the either the public um, or other interested parties wish to make a statement or ask questions. Um, I'll facilitate. It'd be helpful, given that you know we're going to be reviewing this. Uh, it would be helpful to direct any questions you might have to the board for us to consider. Um, as opposed to this is really isn't an opportunity for cross-examination of, of witnesses. So floor is open if anyone has any questions or comments. I guess the city's not going to. Uh, Stephen Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, I want to just call your attention to, I, I'm pleased that I'm hearing that work in the diligence around the process of severing and reapplying and which regulations we're going to go under. That's, that's good work. Um, the, the traffic study, I believe, is also very key. I have been asking for but not been able to get hold of the prior traffic study, I guess, done by Research Systems Group, Resource Systems Group. I will continue to follow up on that. Um, there's a lot of good work in here, but fundamentally it's my informed opinion that this is just the wrong place for a garage, especially a bigger one, because it's going to further encroach on the river. Uh, there's a confluence park that was ironically approved on the same night that the city council voted to proceed, and it's going to basically be isolated through these four-story urban canyons to even get to that park. So um, the impact on the farmer's market, this is going to chop off. This is the first good scale drawing that I've had. I've been trying to model it hypothetically. It's going to basically eliminate about half of the area currently used by our farmer's market. Um, the, I would ask you to take a very close look at the idea of just using an easement through a canyon of two hotels parking lot in the interest of public safety because if there's any emergency ambulance fire incident having to go on, no one's going to be able to get out in or out of that garage through either of these driveways. So um, there had been talk of creating a full street, but that would eliminate all the perpendicular parking that's on either side of that 20-something foot right away. Um, The increased, I imagine this in the zoning regulations, the increased load of salt and sediment and debris falling off of automobiles with the increased surface area of the garage must be considered um, as potential pollutants. I don't, I did not see plans sufficient enough to show whether those were being captured and treated before they were released into the river under the prior plan. Um, the view shed analysis of this 445 story, this is the first night we've heard that number, 45 foot parapet plus elevator and stairs. Uh, its impact on view, I walked this whole circuit, that whole block and took photos. And it's for many angles, it's gonna totally eliminate the view of our 
numerous church steeples or from some angles of the state house and those are huge pieces of our town capital city character so i think i've just raised some red flags for you to uh, i will be providing you know further information as this unfolds but i understand this is under an accelerated timeline to get a city council vote to get it on the November ballot and I don't know how much pressure is going to be brought to bear on your process and due diligence well we don't have an accelerated process here um, it's going to go under the normal uh, review process so for example site plan has to be divided into two parts which is part of the reason now there's no requirement that the two meetings be separated by any type of intervening meeting so you can have them uh, as rapidly as possible but obviously you know our, our goal and our job is to simply review and vet this but again under the very narrow confines of what we're charged with under the zoning regulations here and so you know for example that internal design that's part of the reason why I made a point about that earlier is that you know there may be good reasons to do it one way and there may be good good reasons to do it another that doesn't necessarily come under our purview and that's to a certain extent what the city council has to do in their review and we have to look at the very specific provisions of the bylaws as to you know its its function within the zoning regulations i understood that traffic studies were a part of that and i'm somewhat surprised or seeking clarification on that from bill and who in the next few days uh, mr if i can just yeah make a clarification the subdivision plan has to be in two parts right that's okay, what said, I said you said site plan oh I said um, my, my apologies I meant I was thinking site uh, subdivision I almost said site plan again um, so as far as the, the the traffic goes you know there is no formal requirement for a traffic study except in conditional use um, that requires it however um, you know the applicant is required to make some showing on the impacts of traffic and given the size of this project that's my my recommendation seems as if the applicant is in the process of doing that of providing that kind of data as opposed to say with some of the earlier applications this evening where we were talking about very little and we could take it simply at the testimony of the applicant that changing and a one or two two-room office to a two-room bedroom or residential use isn't going to have a traffic impact and so part of it is just proportional this is a much larger project and I think it makes sense and it sounds as if the applicant wants to to meet that as well um, and sorry can I ask a question um, you said you've been asking for the traffic study that should have been part of the original hotel and garage application process and I know I wasn't quite clear that that's what you were looking for at some point when you were in our office. Yeah, Is that uh, the case? No, I have a pending request for traffic studies. I'm getting the 1990s okay. stuff. But you can, just if you just come down to our office, it may be in the application file, and I'll be there tomorrow. And will the traffic, do you look at the traffic impact of having three simultaneously construction projects of a hotel, a parking garage, and a transit center all at the same time? Even if it's only a year long, that could totally gridlock our town. I th so to a certain extent um, the answer to that is you're welcome to put on that type of evidence how we evaluate it is governed by the bylaws and so what we're going to be looking at is what the scope it allows us to look uh, look at I mean obviously it, it's zoning so our ultimate focus is on final use um, but if you're going to raise concerns and they're valid for temporary site construction issues that are likely to cause traffic it's kind of like the way we imply we, we um, impose certain erosion constrict uh, er erosion standards um, during construction um, but a lot of that is aimed at how do we mitigate an impact that's obviously going to exist if there's a construction project you know Thank you. Yeah. what point of process when chair says strike that does that mean orca has to go back no. and keep it no <laughs> that's just an old lawyer habit so okay. thank you thank you any other uh, individuals that wish to provide any comments questions 
Any other questions from the board members? Okay. Well, thank you all very much for coming, and uh, we look forward to hearing this uh, with your sketch plan review in two weeks. Thank you. Do, you, do you have a small set of the Excellent line. Okay. No, that's fine. I'll make sure I bring extra copies. Well, does Bill have a copy? Yeah, I think it's slightly different on the. Oh, no, I think it's actually completely the same. Yeah. Exactly. Everybody has kind of a diagram. Okay. We do have to continue with our meeting, so if there's any conversations. Good work, by the way. Thank you. All right, our next, uh, the only other business is our next regular meeting, as we've mentioned before, is scheduled for Monday, October 1st, 2018, 7 p.m. here in City Council Chambers. And uh, that is all business, unless anyone has any other issue that they wish to raise. Hearing none, I'll take a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Or a motion by Rob. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ryan. All those in favor to adjourn, please raise your right hand. We are adjourned. Thank you all.